Hello and welcome back to the channel. This video is just a re-upload of the previous G4 M1 conversion, which has said the many, many audio issues. This tries to rectify that. Um, unfortunately, after two years, I don't have all the files anymore. So what I had to do is download the video from YouTube, convert it, fix the audio, um, then now re-upload it again. This is much better. So I did try to listen it many, many times and then it works. Um, there are still in a few places uh, some audio level issues which I can't solve without much distortion. But I think this one is much more watchable and much more enjoyable. So if you came from the previous video, please give it a try. If you haven't seen that one, please watch this one. Uh, thank you and enjoy. In 1998, Apple released a new computer, the first iMac. In many ways, this was a return to the concept of the original Macintosh released in 1984, a true all-in-one. In 2002, Apple released the G4, which quickly became a success and was often called the sunflower or lamp. It wasn't a true all-in-one as it separated the computer from the screen, however, it still occupied less space on your desk than a regular PC would. The G4 was available in three sizes, 15, 17 and 20 inch, CPU varied between 700 MHz and 1.25 GHz, memory could be expanded, depending on the revision, up to 2 GB. The G4 was in production until August of 2004, when Apple introduced the G5 which was the last of the PowerPC-powered iMacs. It was again a true all-in-one, every component was packed behind the screen. The G5 was of course more powerful than the G4, but the power consumption and with that the heat it produced was too much to ever use it in a notebook computer and Apple and IBM failed to solve this problem, which eventually led Apple to switch to Intel CPUs. That is until 2020, when Apple introduced its own desktop class CPU, the M1. The first M1 powered computers came 18 years after the G4 iMac. To put that into perspective, Apple released the first Macintosh in 1984, 18 years before the G4. The G4 iMac is 20 years old this year and to understand what that means in today's world we have to look back 20 years before the G4 to 1982 when Commodore introduced its most iconic model the C64. Which means that the G4 iMac today is as old as the C64 was in 2002 which leads to the problem of usability. I said it in my previous videos that the G4 is not really useful in today's world. The CPU is way too slow, the memory is not enough and the software support is long gone. Therefore in this video we are going to upgrade one of the iMacs I have and I'm going to use an M1 Mac Mini as a donor to revive this iMac. We are going to disassemble this M1 uh, Mac Mini, which has been produced in 2020, and then we are going to use uh, the 20-inch G4 iMac I have, which is sadly non-functional, so it is a good candidate for this upgrade. So we are going to disassemble it, both of them, and then we are going to do the transplant.
it seems we found ourselves a speaker. Dusty, but it's not sticky. So it's going to be alright. So now we just need to get rid of these things. And we can clean the thing. make sure that the video can be uh, transmitted from the Mac Mini to the uh, old 20-inch iMac display, we need to rework the wires. There are four groups of wires coming out of the neck of the screen. One is the inverter, essentially the backlight. Two is the video and clock signal, which leads uh, to this connector here. And one for everything else in the monitor, like the microphone, the power LED. But we're not gonna work on those things today. Let's have a look at the inverter. We don't need to worry about the orange and the purple in this modification because they are not connected. The yellow wire needs power from the computer, providing the signal tell the device to turn on the light. This will be connected to the uh, 14th pin on the TVI connector through a resistor which needs to be in between 6.5 and 7.5 kilo ohms. The green and black wires need to be connected to the ground and blue and red wires needs 24 volts which we are going to take from the original power supply's green wire. Now onto the DVI connector. As you can see a DVI connector has many connections. Luckily for us, we don't need all of them. In fact, we can ignore all the analog bits and the secondary data pins. It still leaves us with 17 pins, however. First, we need to identify the video signals. These pins are providing the digital signals for red, green and blue components. There are two data pins, positive and negative, and one shield, which is essentially ground to dampen any external signal interfering with the video. Now, the black wire in this video cable contains four subgroups, red, green, blue and brown. They are not representative of the actual color signal as you can see. Brown carries the red, the blue carries the green and the green carries the blue signal while the red carries the digital clock signal. Each of these subgroups contain three more extremely thin wires green, red and black. The green connects to the positive data pin, the red to the negative and the black always to the ground or shield pin. From the gray group we need to get the black and white wires to connect to the DDC clock signal which stands for display data channel. Essentially this is used by the monitor to identify itself to the adapter to tell what modes and features it can support. The yellow, purple and orange wires need to be connected to the 12 volts, which we are going to take from the original power supply, and green, grey and blue needs to connect to ground. Pin 14 and 16 are used to tell the computer that there is a monitor connected. However, the IMAX monitor was never designed to be disconnected or connected to other computers, therefore it has no capability to tell this to the computer, so we have to cheat a bit. On pin 14 we get 5 volts from the host computer to wake up the monitor. We can use this and a little 1 kilo ohm resistor to tell the computer that a monitor is present, therefore it can start sending the video signal. Now we can use the 5 volts to do more. Be careful however, this 5 volt reel is not designed to draw any significant power, so if you try to connect it to a drive or something, you might damage the circuitry. The iMac power supply does not generate the 24 volts we need for the inverter unless it is told to do so. So we can do this by connecting this 5 volt signal to the power supply.
personalized white wire, which in turn will engage the 24 volt supply and powers the backlight. This is a great feature because effectively we can turn on and off the backlight with the Mac Mini's video signal. We also have to tell the inverter to wake up too. We need to add a resistor here between this 5 volt and the yellow wire of the inverter. And of course we have to wake up the LCD itself, so we are connecting the 5 volt signal to the pink wire of the LCD's grey wire group. Following these steps we can produce a functioning DVI connector which will allow us to connect the IMAX display to the Mac Mini. Please note however, this is only for the 20 inch display as the 15 and 17 inch necks contain different colored wires and voltages so you cannot replicate this work on those necks. You need to open up the display connector to gain access to the wires. Be very careful when doing this as the wires are very very thin and it is easy to damage them. I spared you from the visuals of my soldering skills, but all wires and resistors are in place, so therefore the connector is ready. It is a good idea to fill the gaps of the DVI cable with some hot glue to make sure the wires can't wiggle and break, plus it helps a bit with the insulation and signal protection. After the soldering is done, I just thought that it was a good idea to test the screen, so I connected it to my PC, and then, as you can see, uh, we've got perfect picture on display, which is brilliant, because that means the hardest part of the conversion is done now. Because the Mac Mini's logic board is different in size and the support holes are not aligned, I had to create a new support plate within the IMAX case. I used the black insulation layer as a template to know what to cut. It provides safe mounting point for the Mac Mini's inside the case without the risk of moving away. Everything is built up. Here is the finished DVI connector connected through a HDMI to DVI adapter and the extra resistors are in place to trick the Mac Mini to get the inverter. So I am going to use the two available uh, USB 3 ports uh, to put it to the back of the computer and also uh, channeling out one of the USB-C ports as well and I also thought that the network port should be uh, put in the back for easier network connection and of course we should have the audio put at the back as well.
after connecting everything, it seems it works fine, although I have to admit that the Bluetooth mouse and keyboard is not working as expected if I put everything into the dome. If I leave it open, then it works. So I have the feeling that the metal case is acting like a Faraday cage and it blocks the, uh, the radio. So. That was a great project, I really enjoyed working on it, although there are a few lessons and a warning I would like to share with you. So the lesson number one is, the dome is deceptive. You would think you've got plenty of space in there, but as a matter of fact you don't. Although it's partially my fault because I decided to keep the power supply for the iMac to feed the monitor because it provides the right voltages, so there's no need to create a new circuitry or anything like that. Uh, but it is space taken away. You also have to put in the power supply for the Mac Mini, which is also going to take space away from you because the power supply uh, for the G4 is not suitable to feed the Mac Mini. So that's that. And also you need to uh, think about the, the wiring inside, the USB ports, Ethernet, and all the other stuff, which is going to take space. And then you will find that, you know, you're running out of space very quickly on this one. So there's a bit of a cramped situation going inside. The second thing I learned, I mean, learned, I anticipated at the beginning is the metal dome is acting like a Faraday's cage, which limits uh, radio frequency or blocks out completely. In my case, there is, I can't use the Bluetooth keyboard and the mouse. I mean, I don't mind using a wired keyboard and a mouse because it adds to the authenticity, but uh, you have to keep in mind that that is blocked. Wi-Fi surprisingly still works uh, with decent efficiency, so uh, that is good. It might be difference between the frequencies or something like that, but no Bluetooth. Now the warning part, the G4 power supply is live from the moment you plugged it in. All the 12 volts rails are live, so you have to be very careful not to cause a short circuit or not to electrocute yourself, right? So just to be very mindful of that one, I warn you, if you do any such work, and I know you know what you're doing, but still be very careful. You don't want to burn yourself or kill yourself or, you know, ruin the device. I mean, priorities. So be careful about yourself first, right? Well, that's the end of it really. Thank you very much for watching. If you like the video, you can do subscribe here uh, or you can leave a comment uh, or a like if you want to. Um, you can also watch another video. And uh, thank you very much for watching and see you next time. Bye-bye. Do you like that? I like that. It's cool.